Hi everyone, my name is Mary Lamaster and I'm the managing partner with A Action Home Inspection Group. Today, we're going to discuss the phase inspection. The phase inspection consists of three phases, phase one, two, and three. Now, I should note that these phase inspections are only done for new build, but even more exciting, it's a little like a choose your own adventure situation. You can do phase one, phase two, you could do phase one, two, and three, phase one, phase three, phase two and three, or just phase three, or just phase one. The possibilities are kind of endless. So let's go ahead and get started. As expected, we'll start with phase one, move to phase two, and move to phase three. Let me go ahead and share my screen here. Here we are. All right, so real quick, what are phase inspections? As I mentioned, is it done on a residential construction only? So you would not get a phase inspection done on a pre-existing standing home, like the one I'm in now, or on a commercial building, new construction residential only. It follows the home from the moment the foundation is prepared to the final walkthrough. I mentioned this as well. There are three phases, phase one, which is pre-pour, phase two, which is framing, and phase three, the final inspection. Let's go ahead and get started with phase one, also known as the pre-pour inspection. Why is it called the pre-pour? Because this is done before the foundation poured when the home is just a hole in the ground. The inspection examines the blueprint and the footprint of the home to make sure that the foundation will be poured correctly. So this is really important to have the blueprints or the general survey of the home because that way the inspector can go out and make sure the home is mapped out correctly in the form. Let's take a look at that. It's gonna look like this. Obviously not every home is gonna be this design, but it should match the general survey that the builder made, which means if there's a bay window on the survey, but no bay window at the phase one, that means there's some issues and the builder needs to correct that before they pour the cement. Because once they pour the cement, it is a lot harder to get things fixed. So what's covered in the phase one inspection? A review of the builder survey, edge forms, beams and footing, steel reinforcement, post-tension cables, moisture barriers, and plumbing. Now, don't worry if you don't know what any of these things are, because we will get to them in this class. That's why you're here. So let's start with the edge form. The edge form is a temporary frame that's constructed before the foundation is poured. It's kind of like those um, spring forms you use to make cake, where you pour the cake in and you bake it, and then when the cake's done, you pop the spring form off and it's a fully formed cake. You don't have to worry about dumping the cake out. It's the same idea as an edge form. It is there to basically frame where the foundation will go. The frame also helps support all the other components that need to go into the foundation before it's poured. So the uh, post-tension cables and the rebar, et cetera, which we'll get to in a second. Once the concrete is dry, dried, excuse me, the edge form will be removed. You don't wanna move into a home with an edge form already or still attached to it. That's a great way to attract termites. In residential, the edge form is usually made of wood. And out in the phase one inspection, the inspector is looking to make sure the edge form is installed correctly. And it needs to be able to support the weight of the poured concrete. And one more and, it needs to be level. So before we hit to beams and footing, let's take a look at that edge form real quick. Sorry, we have to pop back a few times here. Let me annotate so you know what I'm looking at. Oops, let me get a better color. We'll use black. This wood thing around the home is the edge form. It literally makes the form of the home. And you see there's another one to make the porch. This one is for the garage. Oh, that's a bad line, garage portion. But yeah, you see, this, is, this wood piece around the entirety of the house is the edge form and it will be removed once the concrete is poured. Let's head back to beams and footing. Beams and footing. So the ground beam spans one point of the foundation to another to offer support. It's very easy to install. And the reason we do it here in the Houston area is because we don't have basements. Now, if we had basements, we'd be digger, digging deeper holes and doing basement foundations, but we do not have basements in the Houston area. It's clay and sandy soil. So we have what's called a slab foundation. That means the house is sitting on a concrete slab. Now, obviously some homes are sitting on stilts, they're pier and beam, right? But in this case, with most new construction tracked homes, it's gonna be a slab foundation. That's why we're gonna focus on this 
uh, inspection of the beams and footing for a slab foundation today. Now, the footing is an area of soil that transmits the weight of the wall directly into the soil. That way your house isn't bowing out or caving in. In the phase one, the inspector is gonna examine the depth and width of the beams and the grading of the footing. So let's pop back to that picture. Let's see if I can do it this way. Oh, look at that. Pop back to that picture. You see these individual, it's, you actually can't see the, um, <clears throat> the beams in this picture, I apologize. But we can see the footing. There are these individual grid line squares here. And that is there basically to help spread the weight of the house. Underneath these tarps, there's dirt underneath these tarps. That is the footing. All right, let's zoom back out. Whee! We were at beams and footing. Our next one are the steel reinforcements. And that's just a fancy word for rebar. Now, again, we have concrete slabs, uh, not basements, and concrete slabs are very strong when it comes to compression. So that's the weight of the home pushing down on the slab. Concrete slab, pretty strong for that, but it is not strong in regard to tension. So that is the weight of the home settling uh, in different areas. So we want our home to settle uniformly, right? Push down, but sometimes it settles in different areas or there's different weight or the soil is moving and that creates tension and concrete slabs do not tension Oh, excuse me, do not like tension, and that's when they break. So what that means is um, you need steel reinforcements or, re or rebar because it helps um, the concrete slab deal with tension. Typically, a home needs one stick of rebar for every eight inches of slab width. So in the phase one inspection, the rebar is inspected in the following areas, around the beam footing, around fireplaces, steps, and corners, it's also inspected for overlap, support, relation to non-binding agents, and contact with post-tension cables. Now, what are post-tension cables? We'll get to those, don't worry. But first, this is what the rebar looked like. Now, remember in that other picture we're using, you see the um, tarp over the footing, right? Well, in this picture, there is no footing because they are, have in, are installing the rebar. The rebar is this more grids, lots of grids in this story, isn't there? Oh, who's drawing this? Let me try that again. The rebar is this. I hope this annotation shows up in the recording. I never really trust Zoom. If not, I'm just talking to myself and you're not seeing any lines drawn, but I am drawing lines to cover the rebar here. And over that's gonna go the footing and over that goes the tarp. But the rebar, remember, is there to help tension, uh, to help the slab deal with tension. Um, or else it would snap, not a fun day for anyone. Speaking of tension, now we have post-tension cables. Now this goes over that tarp, over the footing. It further reinforces, or excuse me, post-tension cables further reinforce the concrete foundation. They are, again are placed before the concrete is poured. And then after the concrete is poured and the concrete dries 100%, the tables are tightened or tensioned. And that pre-stresses the foundation, the slab foundation, further allowing it to deal with any tension that might arise and hopefully prevents cracking. This allows for our foundations to be thinner, which they are, because remember we're on slabs here in the Houston area. It also allows the foundation to be built on softer soil. Again, a great bonus because we're on clay and sandy soil. In the phase one inspection, the inspector will be looking for the following. How many post-tension cables? Are the tables, <laughs> tables, are the cables set correctly? Are the cables in good condition? Are the cables in the correct location? Let me say that again. Are the cables correctly located in corners and around plumbing? Are the cables properly supported? They need to have little chairs to support them. And do the cables have proper clearance? Now, let's go back to that picture real quick. I realize I need to have more pictures in here after the fact. Let's see if I can find, ah, here it is. These light blue thing, these light blue things, let's add annotation in these things right here. Again, with the grids, more grids. These are the post-tension cables. And once the foundation is poured and dried, then they will be pulled tightly. So right now you see they're kind of limp. So after the foundation's poured and dried, they are pulled tightly. And that's what helped pre-stress the slab, allowing it to live happily ever after. Let's head back. By the way, moisture barrier, which we're about to talk about, is the blue tarp thing. 
keep talking about the blue tarp thing. You keep seeing the blue tarp thing. It's called a moisture barrier. Let's head to, there it is. Now, it does pretty much obviously what it sounds like. It prevents water vapor, vapor from um, hitting the concrete foundation. Uh, any extra water vapor in the concrete foundation can deteriorate the concrete and damage any seals and overlays after the concrete is poured and dried. In the phase one, the inspector is looking for the following. Is the moisture barrier the correct thickness? Is the moisture barrier correctly overlapped? Does the moisture barrier properly overlap the plumbing? Is the moisture barrier sealed correctly? And is or are there any damage or tears to the moisture barrier? Again, that is that blue tarp. Next, we have the plumbing. So obviously, because it's just a hole in the ground, our plumbing at this point in the building process is going to be pretty rudimentary. In the phase one inspection, the inspector is looking to make sure the plumbing that's run under the home is installed correctly. They're also looking for any plumbing that's going to go up into the walls that have the openings there um, to add that plumbing. Also, any plumbing that's sticking up needs to be capped with an actual cap, cannot have tape, and that prevents any dirt or dust dust or debris from getting in the pipe or even concrete when they pour it. So the home inspector is looking for the following, the main sewer line drains and clean outs. They're also gonna report on some a few other things. Is the plumbing installed correctly? The size of the main sewer line, the material used for the main sewer line, location of the main clean out, the sloping of the drainage system, is the plumbing properly protected for the foundation pour, that's that cap on it, and all the, are the water lines clear of dirt and debris? pretty basic. So here's some common problems we usually find in the phase one inspection. The form boards, which are those edge forms, are not backfilled to prevent blowout. So they need to make sure all the dirt is filled in around that form, because if it's not, your concrete's going to just ooze out when it gets poured. Beams are not cleared of trash or debris. Cave-ins around the beams, again, you wanna make sure your foundation, uh, your beams are properly leveled or else the foundation is gonna be poured incorrectly. Post-tension cables not installed correctly. Vapor barrier has holes in it. Vapor barrier is not sealed. Vapor barrier is not overlapped. Remember the vapor barrier is that uh, tarp, blue tarp. Drain system not installed correctly. Drain system not sloped. This is an interesting thing. Your plumbing system in your pre-pour needs to have a negative slope, which means it's taking the waste from your house out of the home. If it has a positive slope, the waste coming out of your house isn't really gonna drain correctly. And that's not a fun day for anybody. Also, you need to make sure the drain system is protected properly. And what do we mean by that? What we mean is um, the drain system needs to be protected from those post-tension cables. Cause if there's post-tension cables overlapping the drain system and when they tension the cables, it's gonna snap your pipes underneath your house. And you'll never know because once the foundation's poured all the secrets are buried with it. Not fun. Also make sure it wanna also want to make sure, wow, I can't get that out, that there is that rubber cap on top. So no concrete actually get accidentally gets poured down your um, pipes. Again, not very fun. So the big thing to know about the phase one template is that all inspection companies have different one. In fact, the phase one inspection is not regulated by TREC. So what that means is anyone can actually do a phase one inspection. Isn't that crazy? However, you wanna probably hire a home inspector because they're gonna have the best knowledge of what needs to go in the home and how everything needs to look. Just so you know, all the templates are different because they're not regulated by TREC, which means that TREC does not issue a template for the phase one inspection. So all home inspection companies are gonna cover the things we talked about, but it's probably gonna look different depending on which company you hire. Now let's watch a quick video. Actually, it's a long video, but it'll help explain everything we just talked about in regards to the phase one inspection. All right, today we have a phase one inspection, also known as a pre-pour inspection or a foundation inspection. I love doing these ones. I find all kinds of weird things. Uh, they like to, they put these things together real quick. And so it really is good to get another pair of eyes on them. Uh, the, how I'm gonna strap, lay this video out is I'm gonna talk about the strategy first of how I go about inspecting these.
Oops, sorry. And then I'll talk about each item individually so we can um, kind of do a layout. Maybe you can learn something there in the way. If I don't cover something, it's because each one of these, it's a different scenario. And um, we're going to do this again. So if you like these types of videos, please hit that subscribe button below and uh, catch us on the next one. All right, let's go check it out. Okay, step one, whenever I'm inspecting these pre-pours, it actually starts with the approach whenever you walk up to the property is I like to look at the... I like to look at the grading. So the grading is one of the most important items because you want to make sure that your property is going to shed water. In these cookie cutter neighborhoods, it doesn't really show up in the report too often. It's because they already have these prop these places pre-laid out. So the grading is going to normally be on one of the, uh, give me a second, one of the custom homes where you're building a, on, a, on a custom lot. So that's when it's going to come into play more. But you want to make sure that the property is shedding water. It's six inches over 10 feet or there's a proper swell. So the water, the property is going to shed water properly. Water is the number one reason why foundations move. And if you have standing water or water's pouring into the structure, your foundation will move in the future. So the next step is I like to start, start my way out and work my way in. So I like to look at the former boards all the way around. So I'll walk around this property once or twice, more than once. I walk around it twice in two different directions. This helps make sure that I like to make sure all the boards are straight and that they have a 45 degree angle brace. It's really important that they're level too as well. So we'll take out the zip level and we'll test the levelness from side to side and front to back. The reason why you do this is because if you find out that it's out of level right now, they can fix it pretty easily. But if they pour that concrete, that's a whole different ball game. So this is the best time to, to test the levelness across your foundation and make sure those boards are flat. If those boards aren't flat and they're canted, you're gonna get a sideways concrete wall and then I also like to spot any deformities in the boards too as well. So if the board's warped or there's imprints in that former board, that will actually imprint onto the concrete wall too as well. So you wanna make sure that you, knock, you, make, you pay special attention to these former boards on the outside. Or the next step in this strategy is I like to focus on the beams and pads. So I like to break down, you're starting to see that I like to break down each section individually and I look at that specifically separate. So I'll look at the beams and pads and I'll make sure that they match the plans that are on site that are drawn up by the engineer. It is pretty easy. You literally just look at the plans and then you make sure it matches. Um, this step is a little tedious. Make sure that you don't rush through this. Every 10 feet, you know, you stop and you take a look at it because there's been several times where I've been walking. I'd be like, hey, there's a built, there's supposed to be a built out window right here. So it's really important that you take your time on this step and uh, look at it as we go. Unfortunately, we don't have the plans for this site. This site isn't even ours, really. Our site is over there. They told us it was done <laughs> and it's not. So, uh, but that is the strategy that we like to follow. So that's the next one. All right, I'm going to go and talk about the next tip next. The next thing I like to do after I do the beams and pads is I'll move on to the next area of the post tension cables. I'll make sure the post tension cables are per, per plan and that they're properly installed. Post tension cables, there's a lot that they can do wrong with them, uh, but just some basic facts about them. You can't have any of the metal exposed. You want to make sure that they don't use duct tape to wrap them up. They do that pretty often. They need to be three inches away from plumbing. Any time that there is any elevation change, you need a chair on the elevation change. Uh, they cannot be twisted. They need to be securely fastened to the board. They, can, they have to be straight. They cannot be leaning. So there's a lot of things that you have to look for. They have to be six inches from the edge. So my dad actually puts on a really good class that's through RETS. If you're looking for to learn more code related items with these, you can run through that class or you can purchase maybe even the slideshow from them. I'll leave his contact information below. All right, let's move on to the next item. All right, the next thing that we like to look at is I like to focus on the rebar. Uh, the rebar on plans show up as a little dotted line on the side, and you want to make sure that the rebar matches the plan specifically. I find this all the time where it's not installed at all in the areas that they wanted to. So it's a pretty common find to find rebar not in the proper place. So um, yeah. So that's that. So the next item that we like to go to is I'll make sure that the plumbing is in the exact areas that matches the plan. 
it happens sometimes where we'll be doing the inspection and it needs to be like six, six inches to the left or six inches to the right. And that actually makes a huge impact whenever they're building the bathrooms down the line. So um, that's some basic steps uh, with our strategy. Let's uh, break in down into it and dive into each item individually and show you some of the problems that we found with them. All right. All right. So back to the beginning and we're going to talk about the former boards. Uh, these former boards, one of the most common things that we find every single time is they're, they're not, they don't have backfill properly. They say they do this on the day of the pour. They'll come in and put backfill on there uh, to prevent the concrete from overflowing in these areas. But who knows? But we make sure that it's in our report every time so they know that, that they're missing a lot of backfill over here. It's really important that you do this. It adds additional support to the board and it prevents them from wasting concrete and creating those deformities on the bottom of your slab. So whenever you're inspecting the pads, I like to walk on the edges of them and I like to walk on every single one. And you'll find it pretty often that one is poorly compacted and it just crumbles underneath you. So this is actually pretty bad because concrete's pretty heavy and I only weigh like 157 pounds. So, you know, if I'm knocking that pad over, you know, it's just gonna crumble whenever they start pouring concrete. The next step is, it's uh, one of my favorite parts, is you can do most of this inspection just with a tape measure, your brain, and your eyes. And that's why it's pretty nice. You're not walking around in a house. But anyways, going back into it, started rambling. You want to check the depth of the foundation. And whenever you're checking the depth of the foundation, you the average thickness is about 23 inches, and it needs to be 10 inches below grade. So it can't just be 23 inches and sitting on top of the earth. It needs to be 10 inches below the actual grade outside. So I'll show you how I get those uh, measurements. Checking the, checking the depth is actually fairly easy. You just find an area where they have the uh, pull string, the pull strings down on this site, or you can come to the edge of the foundation and you just uh, make it as straight as you possibly can. And uh, you just measure it from the top of the footer right here. And you can see this one is about 30 inches. It's 30 inches deep, so that's pretty good, but make sure that you do it all around the foundation. So uh, there's the pull string over there. So I'll walk over there and show you too. Just because it's 30 inches here doesn't mean it's 30 inches everywhere. So it's very important that you check this in several areas because the other day I found one that was 30 inches deep on one side of the house and it was only like 10 inches deep on another side of the house. So you wanna do this in several areas across your foundation. So there you go. That's about 27 inches. So that's pretty good right there. And then we'll check in several areas down the line. Okay, you know, it's actually pretty easy to know which areas to target specifically too, because as you walked around once already doing just your general scan, you can just eyeball it and be like, hey, that spot looks a little low. So you wanna make sure that you focus on those areas the general, uh, that you did your general scan on. All right, so we did the beams, we did the pads. Let's uh, talk about the post-tension cables now. All right, so with these post-tension cables, none of them are protected properly on the ends. With post-tension cables, one of the most important things is that they're protected because what happens is, is the concrete adheres to the, uh, the cable underneath them, the post-tension cable, and it can cause them to break uh, a lot faster than they should at all. They shouldn't break at all if they're protected. So they need to make sure that sleeve goes all the way to the end. A lot of the times what they like to do is they like to add in duct tape and duct tape is definitely not the fix. They actually have to recut another sleeve and wrap it around it so it's properly protected. Uh, the next thing is, is pretty much on every single one of your inspections, you all there. there's never enough chairs. You need a separation. They need to all be lifted properly off the ground and even in the beams too as well. They need to be lifted off the ground. They're actually all lifted off the ground here. So that's pretty nice. Um, and then the real close eye, you wanna always make sure that they're not twisted. If they're not twist, if they're twisted, that can lead to several issues down the line whenever they're pulling them tight. So yeah. Another thing that we can cover is uh, sometimes it's only happened once and it happened to my father, but they actually put the vapor barrier on top of the post-tension cables. I don't feel like I needed to say it, but the post-tension the post cables go on top of the vapor barrier. So that is another uh, important topic whenever you're looking at these post-tension cables. 
You always want to count them front to back and side to side and make sure they match the plans. All right, let's go uh, hit the next item. Right there, I, I didn't cover two of the spots of the deficiencies we found. The uh, first one was is that there wasn't proper separation between the plumbing and the, and the post tension cable. There needs to be two inches or at least a chair there. And then also uh, the elevation changes. You can see right here, the elevation changes in going into the garage and you need a chair separating the elevation change in the post tension cable. All right, um, let's check out the next items. All right, then one of the other things that you need to make sure that you're looking at is you're taking a look at the vapor barrier. The vapor barrier, you can't have any cuts or tears in it. Uh, you wanna tape up any hole puncture. So a repair like this, what they need to do is they come in with another vapor barrier, they'll overlap it. It needs to be overlapped by six inches. So they can't just come in and tape it. If they do that, it's just gonna come apart again whenever they start pouring the concrete. The next area is they need to make sure that all the, the plumbing stacks are capped. A lot of the times they like to just put a bag over it or they like to just tape it. That isn't the proper way to keep all the debris or concrete out of your, out of your plumbing system <laughs> before it gets up. You wanna to try to prevent anything from getting in there too early. So to keep it clean, they cap them off with, uh, with hard caps. So that's how it should be right here. Um, all right. Let's go on to the next item. We got a triple whammy here at this drain line. So first thing that we notice is that the drain line is not protected by a sleeve. So concrete is going to rest directly on this, which could be uh, could cause future issues. Second thing we notice is the post tension cables are too close in. They should have a two inch clearance minimum so that when they tighten them, it doesn't snap the drain line. And last thing we notice is that the drain line goes from the P-trap and actually drains up. So it's a negative slope. So if we didn't catch this before they poured the foundation, these homeowners are gonna have all kinds of issues with this drain. The next item right here is uh, what we talked about is the rebar. Rebar is pretty easy uh, whenever you're trying to inspect it. You just make sure that it matches the plans. Right here, you can see that this rebar isn't properly supported. It's just sitting down there in the beam. It needs to be braced and what, the rule is, is it needs to sit in the mid range. So wherever the concrete is, say it's four inches off the pad, it needs to be at the inch and a half or two inch mark where, where that rebar is sitting. So right now it's not efficiently put in there, but whenever you're inspecting the rebar, make sure that it's sitting in mid level and it's off the, the bottom grade. That's pretty easy, you know, there's not much else to look for whenever you're looking at rebar. The biggest tip that I can have whenever you're doing a pre-pour inspection is just make sure you take your time. If you're only out here for like 30 minutes or so, you're going to end up missing something. So if you feel like you did it too quick, make sure that you just do it again and I'll walk it over again. You're like, oh man, I missed this tear. Or I missed this hole or these post tension cables aren't properly braced. All right, we're going to wrap up the video there. If you have any questions or comments about phase inspections or something else you'd like us to cover on phase inspections, please leave a comment below and please always like and subscribe to the videos. Thanks, guys. Bye. So I sh probably should have mentioned in the beginning that all these videos I'm showing are done by my company. Um, that was Chris Murphy. He is the other owner of this company. Um, but I like that video. I know it was really long, so I apologize for that. But I like that video because it really details um, every single thing we talked about. And it shows you in real time what it actually looks about, about what it actually looks like. It'd be helpful if I could actually talk clearly, right? Okay, on that note, that was phase one. Now we're going to get ready and head into phase two. So let's stop sharing this. All right, so let's go ahead and share the screen for phase two. And once again, you kind of recognize this slide here. We have what is a phase inspection, but let's look at the bottom here. What is a phase two? Now, a phase two is done when the house is fully framed, but before the sheetrock has been installed. So what does that mean? It looks like a house now. It is the frame of a house. It has basically walls on the outside, but there's no walls on the inside. It's just a bunch of wood everywhere. So no sheetrock has been installed yet. Take a look. There we go. We have a house, looks like a house, but when you walk inside, it's just gonna be wood beams everywhere. The floor is wood, the ceiling's wood. There's no granite, there's no tile, there's no carpet, et cetera, et cetera. Very, very basic um, 
model of a home, essentially. <clears throat> so what's covered in the phase two? Foundation, frame, roof structure, electrical, HVAC, plumbing, the water heater equipment, and the dryer exhaust system. Well, let's take a look. And I have pictures, don't worry. We'll start with the foundation. The, in the phase two, the inspector is again identifying what foundation the home is. Now remember, you don't have to get your phases done all one, two, three. Some people start at phase two. So at this point, you know, it's very important still to identify the type of foundation for the home. In fact, as we'll see in phase three, they identify the foundation again. So there's only two types of foundations that are going to be identified in the Houston metro area. That's going to be the slab and the pier and beam. Here in the corner, you see I have a diagram of what a pier and beam is exactly. And that's when you have a, uh, I basically like a miniature slab. Let me get the annotation out here. Basically like a miniature slab underground, each of these slabs supports an individual pier. So let me draw this totally to scale diagram. We have these, no, oh, I don't like it. Let's try again. Here's the ground. I don't know why I can't draw a straight line today. Here's the ground, better. And then underneath the ground, you'll have these individual slabs, which we'll call piers. They're concrete individual slabs. They're gonna be a little more in line than what I'm drawing here. You see, they have rebar. It's kind of the same idea of what we talked about is in the slab, rebar, tension cables, everything, the whole nine yards. Into those beams, or excuse me, those piers, you have beams that come up out of the ground. Again, I hope you can see this drawing and I'm not just talking to myself here. And on top of those beams, it's the house, hopefully more level than what I've just drawn. Yay, the house. Oh my God, that looks like a terrifying house. Uh, that's the pier and beam. So the inspector in the phase two, they're gonna identify what foundation the house has. Or at this point, they can't really study what's in the foundation because the concrete's already been poured. That's why you wanna get a phase one inspection, right? Then we have the frame. This is what the house, the frame of the house, the, what the walls are gonna go on, et cetera, et cetera. There's a couple of different aspects to the frame and I'm gonna show pictures of all of these, but let's go ahead and define them first. You have the bottom blade anchorage, which is neither a plate or an anchor. It affixes the walls of the home to the slab foundation. Wall bracing protects the home from a windstorm. Bearing wall stud supports the weight of the floor or roof. The lintels are the horizontal support of the windows and doors. And uh, they're also, the inspector's also gonna examine the non-bearing walls in the window doors and frames. So let's take a look. First, you have the bottom plane anchor. This is what is anchoring your home to the frame, the walls of your home to the frame. I'm sorry, let me rephrase that. This is what's anchoring the walls of your home to the foundation. There it is, that's what I was trying to say. So here is the foundation, which we just talked about quite a bit in phase one. And to that, you have the frame of the home anchored on using this screw and plate system. Now, um, the plate, as I said, not a plate. It is just a two by four that is sitting on top of your foundation. That seems pretty scary, right? I can't believe my house is only connected to the foundation with this tiny little screw and washer, but it's not just one. There are multiples of these throughout the home on the bottom plate. Um, so yeah, your home is pretty anchored. It takes a pretty big windstorm to blow over a slabbed home. Those pier and beam homes is another, uh, another one, right? Uh, you've seen those images from hurricanes where the homes are completely off their stilts. Uh, that's a different story for a different day. This is the wall bracing. Speaking of windstorm, the wall bracing is what goes in our walls. It's this X thing here to help support the walls so they don't bow in or crack or break open or shatter during a heavy windstorm. Depending on when you where you live in Houston, you're gonna have different requirements. Uh, you know, Houston is made up of evacuation zones. I'm actually not in an evacuation zone at all. Uh, so my home probably has little to no windstorm bracing. Obviously, if you're in zones one, two, three, or four, you probably have a lot different windstorm bracing only because it gets pretty hectic. As you know, we're in the Gulf Coast. We get them high winds, mostly flooding though. I live in Memorial, so it's all about the flooding. The bearing wall stud. All right, so the bearing wall stud, bear with me as I describe this, is what supports each uh, ceiling, 
of the home. So, and the floor over, uh, over. Let me try that again. The bearing wall stud is what support each floor of the home. There we go. So you have a uh, multi-story home. Here it is. We have the first floor, the second floor, the third floor, and then the attic area. That house looks like a sad cake, doesn't it? All right. <clears throat> First floor is going to have a bearing wall stud. Second floor is going to have a bearing wall stud. And the third floor will have a bearing wall stud because it's supporting the attic and roof section. And I should actually, it's in the middle. It's not on the sides. Sorry about that. Um, so the bearing wall stud is going to be in the middle of the home. And actually, it will be on the sides as low bearing side walls to support the weight of the home as you build up. So the home inspector, if you have a multi-story home, he's gonna be inspecting that bearing wall stud to make sure the house can support the weight of each individual floor. The lintels, that's a nice easy one. It is the cross piece that goes over all your doors and windows. That helps the house support the weight of the doors and windows. Because if you cut holes in the walls of your house, the holes are a uh, stress point. Having those lintels there helps alleviate the stress. We're all about de-stressing our house and de-stressing our lives, right? Now, what about the roof structure? Now you see there's actually quite a bit, quite a few different components in the roof structure that's examined in phase two. And don't worry, I'll, I, I will be, I should say, defining all of these as well. First, you have the rafters, purlins, ridge board, the hip ridge board, ceiling joists, roof sheathing, attic ventilation, roofing material, and flashing. Let's take a look at that. These are the rafters. They are the sloped, hold on, annotation's going crazy there. It, rafters, the sloped wooden beams that support the weight of the roof. So let me annotate it. Let me try and annotate it. That's what I've been trying to do. In the phase one inspection, or excuse me, in the phase two inspection, the inspector will be examining the size and spacing of the rafters. Here we go. Now my annotation's working. Size, it's these yellow things. The yellow parts in this picture are what is called the rafters. The purlins are horizontal beams also used as structural support for the roof. They're going, the inspector will be looking for the size of these purlins and making sure they're properly supported. So while the rafters are going vertical, the purlins are going horizontal, nice and easy. Next, we have the ridge board, and the ridge board is where the two points of your roof meet in the middle, and this helps force the weight of the roof outward so your roof doesn't sag or fall in or, uh, you know, damage the house. It's right here in the middle. This is the ridge board, and see, it's pour, pushing the force of the roof outward into the walls of the home, the bearing walls, and that reduces any stress on the home and also helps support the weight of the roof. Easy concept. I forgot to say, in the phase two inspection, the inspector will be looking at the size of the ridge board to make sure it is the proper size for your home. What about the hip ridge board? So we have the ridge board in the middle, but the hip ridge board is for when you have corners of the roof. So there's your ridge board. Here is your hip ridge board is helping to support the corners of your roof. In the phase two inspection, the inspector is making sure the size of the hip ridge board is correct to support the weight of your roof. What about these ceiling joists? So the ceiling joist is what's holding the ceiling of your house up. These vertical or horizontal, depending on how, which way you're standing, I guess. They're attached to the bottom of the rafters. It's where your sheetrock is gonna be attached. It's gonna determine the height of your ceiling, essentially. In the phase two inspection, the inspector will be looking at the size and the spacing of the ceiling joist. What about the roof sheathing, or it could also be called roof decking. This is the under part, the first layer of your roof. Your roof is gonna have three, could have maybe more layers, but should have at least three layers. That first layer is the sheathing, which you see here. It says wooden part, I'm coloring purple. Again, I hope you see these annotations. In the phase two, the inspector is looking at the material and the thickness of the sheathing to make sure it can help support and protect the roof shingles once they're put on the roof. So right now your roof might just have the sheathing. Eventually they'll put felt paper, which is this, and then the shingles or whatever your roof is made of, metal, ceramic, et cetera, et cetera. What about attic ventilation? 
So attics need to have ventilation. They help heat and cool the house, but also they protect any appliances you have in your attic. And since we live in Houston, we have some pretty important appliances in our attics. All homes are gonna have soffit vents. That's where the air gets sucked in. Now, it's again, you have a couple options here. Your air can either go out through the power vent or through the ridge vent, or it can go out through both, or you can have a gable vent. And the gable vent runs lengthwise across down the house where air flows through. So a couple different options for attic ventilation there. In the phase two inspection, the inspector is going to check to see if the roof ventilation meets the current building standards and that your attic will be properly ventilated. Roof material. So um, hopefully by the time the phase two is being worked on, the builder has started to put the roofing material on the roof of the home. So in the phase two inspection, the inspector will identify the type of roofing material that's gonna be used for the house. Once again, is that shingle, is it uh, ceramic, metal, slate, et cetera. Flashing. So flashing is not your gutter system. A flashing system is a uh, metal part on your roof that protects your roof from water penetration and vulnerable areas. So in phase two, where the inspector is actually looking for two specific types of flashing, which is the drip edge flashing and the rake flashing. So if you look at the diagram here, this is a home where the roof line meets the side of the wall. So that could be a garage meeting the second story. You have the rake flashing that's coming down the sides here where the roof, the roofing is meeting the siding. And then you have this rake flashing here which again is protecting the roofing and the soffit. So these are metal portions that are protecting from water penetration, not a gutter system. I know it looks like there needs to be a gutter here and maybe there will be eventually, but the flashing is not a gutter system. What about electrical? So now the house, you know, we're moving to a house or we're moving to a phase where the house actually looks like a house. So they need to check the electrical situation. So the inspector is gonna identify the following the panel box, and they're gonna identify the service provider who installed the panel box. They're gonna count how many panel boxes the house has, are the wires properly installed going from the wall cavity into the panel box, and are the wires properly entering the panel box. Now remember at this point, the home isn't gonna be electrified. It's just wiring. Um, the wires are there, but there's no electricity running through them. So the inspector is just gonna make sure when the electricity is turned on, the wires are correctly connected into the panel box. HVAC component. So in the phase three inspection, the inspector is going to be looking at the HVAC component. Now, a lot of times, I said phase three, excuse me, in phase two inspection, the inspector is going to look at three systems related to the HVAC system. Now, a lot of times at phase two, uh, the actual HVAC hasn't been fully installed. And remember, there's no electricity going through the house. So even if the HVAC system is installed, it's not actually running yet. When the inspector is looking for, if there is no HVAC system installed properly yet, they're going to make sure the footprint is there to install it properly. And we're going to watch a movie here on the phase two where they'll talk about a situation where the footprint hasn't been installed correctly. And what the footprint means is, is the ventilation correct? Uh, is there a space for access in the attic? Is there a walkthrough for access in the attic, et cetera? They're also gonna be looking at the ductwork if the ductwork has been installed. If not, they're gonna make sure that there's accessible areas for ductwork in the house. So for the heating equipment, if the heating equipment has been installed, remember it's not running at this point, they're gonna look for the energy source, the number of heating units and the location of the heating units. Same for the cooling system. If it has been installed, they're gonna check and see if the coil's in place, is there a proper walkway to the cooling system? Is there proper clearance to work on the cooling system? Is there a service light for the cooling system? They're also going to check outside to see if the condenser has been installed. And if it hasn't, they'll be looking again for that blueprint to make sure that when it is installed, it is installed correctly. What about ductwork? So this is how hot or cold air moves through your house. This is usually up in your attic. The inspector is gonna identify the type of ductwork <clears throat> that's gonna be used in the home and if it's been installed it properly. Now that's only if it's installed already. Remember, sometimes at the phase two, your HVAC system has not fully been installed yet. And if it hasn't, the inspector is gonna make sure the footprint is there to allow for insulation to take place properly. 
Plumbing. Okay, so remember in phase one, we were just looking at the house's underground plumbing and making sure it was sloped correctly, running away from the house. So in the phase two, we're getting a little more detailed here and we'll follow up with plumbing again in phase three. In fact, all the items you've seen in phase one and phase two get followed up a third time in phase three, which is kind of why it's important to have all three phases done. So in the phase two, the inspector is going to identify who's in charge of the home's water and waste supply. Is it the city or is it septic, et cetera? What is the water distribution material? Meaning what is the material being used for the plumbing in the house? Is it copper? Is it PEX? Is it PVC? Is the plumbing properly ventilated? You want to make sure those sewer smells are getting out of the house. Are the plumbing stacks on the roof painted properly to prevent UV rays from breaking them down? Are there water lines properly secured in the frame of the home? That's pretty important. You don't want rattling pipes. And are the water lines properly protected from nail damage? That's a big one because when they are installing the walls, the sheetrock, you don't want them nailing through your pipes. That's a bad day for everyone when you take a shower. What about the water heater? So again, just like the HVAC system, the water heater may not be installed at the time of the inspection, uh, the phase two inspection, I should say. However, if it's not installed, they'll uh, just look at the blueprint to make sure the house is ready to receive a water heater properly. If it is installed, they will look for the following things. The energy source of the water heater, the number of units, the size of the water heater equipment, and the location. Location, they're gonna look for no matter what. And finally, the last part of the phase two is the dryer exhaust system. And this is a double one. This is the mechanical exhaust and the dryer exhaust. So the mechanical exhaust is what's gonna be in your bathrooms and your kitchens and your laundry room sometimes. Your dryer exhaust is um, where your lint goes out, which is a huge fire hazard. That's why it's focused on in phase two. If that dryer exhaust is installed run in phase, wrong in phase two, you wanna make sure it is completely healthy and happy by the time you get to phase three. So for the phase two inspection template, it's the same idea as the phase one. <clears throat> Trek doesn't regulate the phase two. So actually anyone can do a phase two inspection. I would highly recommend you getting a home inspector, right? But anyone can do a phase two inspection because it's not regulated. And also because of that, there is no uh, template uh, for anyone to use. Each inspection company has their own template. So again, remember, as you're getting different phase uh, two uh, reports in, that the template might look different. So on that note, let's watch another video. Again, this is one done, done by my company. And this video, we're listening to our lead inspector. His name is Josh Gibson. And Chris is also in this video too. Okay, so we're out on a phase two. We got a zip system installed. We got, we like to call him Josh, the destroyer of home buying dreams. <laughs> no, no, he uh, he's just really good at phase two inspections. And uh, I'm gonna let you follow him today. So I'm gonna follow him around with the camera and uh, he's gonna talk about the zip system, the primary drain lines. We got some vapor barrier issues. We have, uh, issues with the AC system, the way the drain lines are installed, where the condensers place. We got some good stuff for you. So uh, let's go check it out with Josh. Let's go check it out. So on the exterior of this home, they have the zip system, weather barrier. And when we're looking at this or any type of weather barrier, the zip system or the tie bag, the important thing is that it is weather tight or waterproof. Uh, you want zero holes in this. You want anything that could be a potential water leak to be taped over, or uh, they, they make a compound they can put over this to seal up the joints. And so as we're going through on the outside of this home, I noticed there's holes here. Uh, there's holes like this on all four sides of the home uh, that need to be sealed. The next thing is that on these fasteners, the fastener heads should be flush with the material. And so you see these two locations, it's almost this whole row and all the way down, we'll look at a couple of the spots later, but they've overdriven all the nail heads. And what that does is that just creates tiny holes that, that moisture can get into. And so what they've done is they've taken this weather barrier and making it not weather tight. And so we want them to fix this. Uh, there's a few different ways you can fix it. What I recommend is putting a new fastener next to it. So it's properly fastened and sealing everything up nice and tight. So you don't have any, uh, water issues in the future. Uh, so we're further down the same wall, we see an entire row of overdriven pastures directly underneath some windows. And we're always worried about water intrusion at windows. So you can see, I mean, some of these are so overdriven, I don't even see the nail head 
anymore. So you've created a complete hole to this weather type barrier where water is going to come in. And so this is a location where they don't fix this right. That's and that definitely leaves us a window in the future. Uh, the next thing that we notice is the steam flashing around the windows should be installed like shingles. So they should do the top row first and then the sides and then the bottom. You said that backwards. The, the sides first oh. and then the top. No, keep going. Yeah. Sorry, I'm, it's been a long day. Sorry, you <laughs> bottom first, sides, and then the top. Yeah. Did it backwards and it confused me. Um, <laughs> yeah. And so on this one, this one actually is correct. So you can see underneath is behind, and then, then the sides, and then they went over the top. So as water comes down, it'll run down the flashing that gets stuck behind it. But as we go to these two locations, they have the side, but they put the top behind the side. So that is backwards. That is incorrect. It even confused me. So, <laughs> yeah. Correct, incorrect. So we're going to really focus on this area for water intrusion in the future. All right, let's move in a little closer. So you can see here, if water got behind here for whatever reason, it would get behind the tape. And then right here, it would not. All right, the next thing is this black poly membrane that is supposed to go along the edge of the foundation. This is going to be a brick or a masonry home. And this should actually not be fastened against the wall like it currently is, but sitting on the brick or masonry ledge. Uh, if this is not fixed, what this does is they attach the brick and the stone mortar directly to the foundation. And this is what causes those corner pops that you see on a lot of pre existing homes where the corner of the foundation is cracked. It's a cosmetic issue, but we can prevent it by installing this properly. All right, I'm going to jump in front of Josh here real quick and talk about these these holes right here and you really need to follow up and make sure that you make sure that the builder seals this up because we have come out on a reinspection before and they just ignored the inspection report and they just started breaking over what they haven't completed you can fix this fairly easily but you need to make sure that you get on to the builder or you stay stay on them to make sure that it's done correctly so they need to put the compound over it they need to tape it and seal this up just to prevent any issues down the line. So uh, they actually had a copy copy of the HVAC plans uh, on the inside of the home. So it, on the plans, the condenser unit was supposed to go on the other side of the house. For whatever reason, they still installed it here. But we know from looking at the inside, this is the dryer exhaust. So you have all that lint coming from the dryer exhaust that's going to get sucked in to the condenser and just clog up the unit and cause all kinds of future problems. So we're going to recommend that this be fixed and they should move this to the other side like the plans say. Get it. All right. We're going to beat up on the HVAC install a little bit more. Um, so the B-roll that you just saw was the primary drain line, which comes from the AC and drains into the secondary sink. As with all drain lines, it should be sloped downward because that's the way water travels. And it's kind of hard to see from the video, and it's also hard to spot in person. But as it travels behind this return right here, they have it sloped upwards. So that's obviously not going to drain properly and cause issues for the homeowners pretty quickly after they move in. Yeah, and that, you can damage a whole ceiling with that. Yeah. yeah Mold, too. All kinds of bad issues yep, with that. Yep, yep. Here you go. <laughs> Don't leave me sorry. Yeah, you can do your, do you do you. Oh, okay. I, yeah, I say that. Okay, so uh, I'm gonna be a little bit snarky with this one since I have to destroy our face too. Uh, I'm impressed that this home system comes with a wireless drain. So you have a drain line, water is gonna come out here eventually. There's no drain here. It's on the other side of the room, about uh, 12, 14 feet away. Just, so just a small miss. Yeah, it's missed it by that much. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> So yeah, obviously we're going to recommend this to be fixed. Uh, wants to fix this. All right. Okay. Uh, so the electrician got a little crazy with his drill running the wires. 
and they just basically tore up this two by four to the point where it's overboard. And so what we're gonna recommend that they add either a metal boot to support this better, or they can sister up another two by four so that it's structurally sound. So one of those common areas we find water penetrations into a home is around windows. And the pan flush right here in the corner is pretty poorly installed. They drill through it, it's hanging loose. And so if water comes in from this side and runs down, it's gonna get trapped in this corner and cause some issues in the future. All right, so in the master bedroom, uh, we have four points that need joist hangers for this board, this board. We got one in place, missing the other three. So we're batting 25% right now. <laughs> 25%, yeah, so we need some J hangers to be installed, pretty easy to be installed. Wrong, wrong. Ding, 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 ding. Correct. <laughs> All right, doing the shower pan. Okay. All right, so we did find some good things with this house. One thing they did correctly is the two shower pans. Uh, they did the liner properly. And what you want to see at this phase is that the corners of the shower pan are folded over to make the corner. Sometimes you see them cut, and that is incorrect. They need to be folded over so that you don't have shower pan leaks. <laughs> There we go. That's uh, that's uh, Josh, the destroyer of uh, phase twos, and uh, um, he like what we like to say is uh, what, what do we like to say? You earned your paycheck. I earned my paycheck today. Yeah. Got lots of good stuff. Got some good stuff. Uh, made it worthwhile. Okay, sorry about that. Uh, I could not get it to stop. So that is the phase two video. I like that video again because it shows you every single thing we have talked about. So now, if you're with me. Let's head to phase three, our third and final phase. All right, let's go ahead and share phase three. Let's take a look here. Once again, we recognize this title page. And now we're at the bottom. What is a phase three inspection? A phase three inspection, my friends, is done when the house has been completed, but not had the final walkthrough or the loan closed. It's very, very important you do your phase three before the final walkthrough, because a final walkthrough is just that. You are so close to closing at that point. You don't want to find anything catastrophic during your final walkthrough because it could push back closing. So have the phase three inspection done before the final walkthrough. Here it is, the home at phase three, completely move in ready, hypothetically, right? At this point though, someone could live in the house, all the fixtures are installed, it looks like a house. I said move in ready hypothetically, because we often find, in fact, we always find problems at phase three. There's no such thing as a perfect house. And I'm not even saying that to like hit on builders or anything, uh, it's true. So phase three is the final chance for your client, the buyer to hold the builder accountable. The phase three, remember, is done before the final walkthrough, so the builder has a chance to correct everything the buyer has requested. Now, when the final walkthrough is done, the inspector can come back out and attend the final walkthrough or even do another phase three inspection if the buyer is uncomfortable with the builder's uh, uh, fixes, basically. Here's the other thing to remember. Sometimes builders do not want inspectors at the, the final walkthrough, so just make a note of that. Uh, if your builder won't let your inspector attend the final walkthrough, you might have to get a reinspection done of your phase three, but not every time. Most of the time, builders do fix everything, most of the time. So the phase three inspection is also really handy because you can reference it at your one-year warranty. So all new builds have a warranty system, and most builders have a one-year warranty, and in that one-year warranty, anything can be fixed. So you do, at the end of one year, the exact anniversary of the day you closed on your house, you want to get another inspection uh, done or a walkthrough with the builder, and then they will fix any little tiny problems uh, up to that one year. Obviously, in most cases, after the one year, the warranty gets less and less. So it's really important to have that one year warranty inspection done. And you can use the phase three to compare the two to see how your house has aged over the year. Oh, there we go. 
So what are the sections of the phase three? This is the great thing about the phase three. Remember I said the phase one and two had no template. It's not Trek regulated. The phase three is regulated by Trek. Underline exclamation point. Phase three is the residential Trek inspection that is done on the REI 7-5 template. That is the home inspection uh, template you see every time you get a residential home inspection, the phase three must be done on that. So phase three, I'll say it again for everyone in the back, is a Trek inspection, must be done by a Trek inspector. There are six sections covered in the phase three. It's the same exact ones as you'll see in any other residential home inspection. Section one electrical, section two, when I said section one electrical, section one structural, now they're all confused, section two electrical, section three HVAC, section four plumbing, section five appliances, and section six, which are the optional systems. That's going to be your sprinkler system, your pool, uh, septic system, and well water, you know, if they have it. And most new builds are not going to have a septic or a well water, which obviously depends where you're building. Big thing to remember about section six, and this goes for all inspections, not just phase inspections. The cost, Trek says the cost of your inspection must be under, covered under phases one through five. S section six can incur extra cost. Each item on section six can be an extra fee that is uh, allowed by Trek. And that's because the items in section six require extra training that cost the inspector more money. All right, there we go. Now, a few things to note. A Trek ins residential inspection is never a code inspection. Trek has different standards than code inspections, but they do overlap sometimes. Sometimes code standards do meet Trek standards, but not all the time. Another thing to remember, the inspector is going to tell you that this house has been inspected multiple times by city, county, code inspectors, et cetera, et cetera. These are not Trek inspections. Track inspections look for very specific living and safety items, uh, structural, electrical, mechanical, HVAC, et cetera, items that are not always covered by those city, county, or code inspections. Also remember a typical Trek resale inspection does not cover cosmetic issues. However, because a phase three deals with a new build and you, we want your client or the buyer to move into the best, most shiniest new home, the cosmetic issues will be in the phase three inspection, even though it's not typically in your normal uh, Trek residential resale inspection. The purpose of the phase three is to hold the builder accountable. So that's again, why they can look at cosmetic issues in the phase three. Phase three is also a great time to have your client do a blue tape walkthrough of the house. Um, that just means they're taking blue tape and marking any defect they don't like, chip in the paint, whatever, have the builder observe those blue tape defects and fix those as well. Remember, you want your client to move into the best, shiniest brand new home. Big thing to remember though, the phase three inspection does never ever cover mold or other environmental hazards. All right, section one. Now you'll notice some of these items from phase one and phase two. Remember we're building up each time in each phase. So now it's a much more in-depth inspection of each of these items. The foundation, grading and drainage, roof covering, roof structures and attics, walls, interior and exterior, ceilings, floors, doors, interior and exterior, windows, stairways, interior, exterior, fireplaces, chimneys, porches, balconies, decks, and carports. Lots of stuff in section one. Section two covers your electrical panel again, and also covers the light switches and the electrical fixtures in the house, the plugs, et cetera. You'd be amazed how often we find light switches that don't turn lights on or electrical plugs that aren't electrified in new builds. It's a very, very common thing, but also a very easy fix. But again, it's something you want the builder to fix before you move in, because you don't want to move in and not have working lights. Section three covers the HVAC. So remember in section two, if the HVAC wasn't installed, we were looking at the blueprint. By section three, the HVAC's installed and the electricity is running through the house. So the home inspector is gonna test out the entire system to make sure it actually runs. They're also gonna revisit that duct work, make sure it's connected correctly. Section four covers plumbing. Um, how plumbing is going through the house, so they're going to turn your faucets on and off, make sure they drain properly. If you have a jetty tub in the master or the primary, excuse me, they'll run that. They're also um, going to look at the water heater again. Section five 
covers the following appliance. I want you to remember for section five, it never covers the uh, fridge or the washer and dryer. Those aren't considered real. That's a capital R uh, items, which means they're not real estate items in the state of Texas. Um, so your uh, fridge and washer and dryer are never gonna be covered in any Trek inspection, not just phase three, that's any Trek inspection. So um, that would be dishwashers. What, excuse me, what is covered is dishwashers, garbage disposal, range hood and exhaust system, ranges, cooktops and ovens, mechanical exhaust beds and bathroom heaters, garage door opener and the dryer exhaust system. There's that dryer exhaust system. Remember it had its own section in phase two. In phase three, it's part of section five, but again, they wanna make sure that that dryer lint is leaving the house properly. So there is no fire. Section five, six, excuse me, haha, <laughs> section six, remember optional systems. These are systems the inspector can charge extra money for. So always remember section six items can incur an extra charge. That includes your sprinkler system, your pool system, outbuildings. That's a big one. If there's a barn or a she shed or a guest bedroom uh, that's outside of the uh, residential structure, that's going to be in section six. Private water wells and septic systems. All right. And as I mentioned, the phase three inspection template is the REI 7 5. There are uh, unlike phase one and phase two, where the inspection company can use whatever template they come up with in the phase three, it must be done by a Trek inspector and it must be done on the REI 7-5. And unfortunately, I wish there was a video for this, but there isn't. So let's stop sharing. That's it. That's phase one, two, and three. I know that was a lot of information. So if you do have any questions, my information will pop up at the end of this video. You can feel free to contact me. If you're interested in a phase inspection, you can feel free to contact my company. Once again, my name is Mary LeMaster and I am the managing partner of A Action Home Inspection Group. Thank you so much for joining me on this video. I hope you learned a lot. And remember, if you have any questions, feel free to let me know. Have a fantastic day.